We are at a point in our study of the life of Christ where we are at Friday of Passion Week and Jesus has just given up his spirit. He has died on the cross. He has issued his, uh, or spoke his final words, which were to tell us die, which means it is finished. And he gave up his spirit uh, to God. And now today we are going to study the responses of people and the responses of nature to the death of Christ. Some incredible things happened and some prophetic words were fulfilled when Christ died. Uh, as, as hard as it is for us to think about this gentle, loving, compassionate man, God in the flesh, suffering the kind of death that he died. It's through his death that we have victory over sin. And it's through his resurrection that we have victory over the grave. And we're going to see this played out uh, in the responses that, that occur directly after Christ's death. Um, you can... Follow along in any one of these gospel accounts, Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23. But really, we're going to be a lot in the book of John. Um, so it's what I'm going to read to you is a combination of the four accounts, but most of it or a lot of it will come from the book of John. So if you want to take your Bibles and follow along, um, that would be great. But to start, it'll be at Matthew chapter 27. And this is what Matthew records. At that moment... And that be the moment of Christ's death. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Now, there were two curtains in the temple. One uh, uh, was a barrier to the outer court of the Jews and the holy place of God. The second curtain was a barrier between the holy place of God and the Holy of Holies. And if you recall, the Holy of Holies was a place where the priest went in once a year. And that's where he met God and made atonement for sin. Okay? Um, so the curtain that is torn publicly, most people would have known about it if it would have been the outer curtain. But Alfred Edersheim, who, who I've quoted before, a Jewish scholar, indicates that it was the inner curtain that was 60 foot wide, 30 foot high, and as thick as the palm of your hand. And it was torn from top to bottom. So it didn't tear because it was worn as it would be torn at the bottom. It tore from the top to the bottom. How could someone reach up 30 foot high and tear a curtain? At that very moment, this was a supernatural event. In Hebrews chapter 10, this is what the Hebrew writer writes about this very thing. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, that being the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, his body now becomes the curtain that we have the ability to come before the throne of God. And since we have a great priest forever of the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that brings faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So Jesus, at the very moment he dies, symbolically the curtain tears from top to bottom. And this represents the fact that there is no longer anything between us and God. Through Christ, we have access directly to the throne of God. You don't have to go to a priest to pray. You don't have to uh, do any tradition or, or any type of uh, ordinance in order to go before the throne of God. You have access all the time, unfettered, through the body and the blood of Christ. Continuing in Matthew, the earth shook. There was a great earthquake. And rocks 
split. Okay, We've seen in movies, has anybody been in a real earthquake? I never have. Have any of you? All I've seen is earthquakes in the movies. And you know, in the movies, they do everything extra super special. And, and the ground shakes and the, and the rocks split. Well, this is what happened. There was a severe earthquake, enough that whole rocks split open. The tombs broke open. And the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now that is another incredible supernatural event. When the earthquake occurred, the tombs broke open. And after Jesus rose from the dead, other holy people were resurrected and went into Jerusalem and were seen. And you say, that's unbelievable. Well, no, it really isn't. Jesus rose from the dead. We're promised in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we, like Christ, will raise from the dead. And it's in that promise of hope that I have uh, great comfort knowing that after I die, Jesus will raise me from the dead. I hope you share in that same promise because it is true. And this is an example of it. Now the centurion, and that be the one that was in charge of of Jesus' execution, a Roman soldier, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died and saw the earthquake and all that had happened, as you recall, there had been complete darkness for three hours over the land. They were, they were on Golgotha in complete blackness, pitch black, and then this earthquake occurred when all this happened, they were terrified and they praised God and exclaimed, surely he, this man Jesus, was the son of God, a righteous man. These aren't Jews that know anything about Jehovah. These are Roman soldiers who worship false idols and false gods and in their testimony of everything they see, of everything they've heard, Jesus' demeanor on the cross was that of a forgiving uh, spirit. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not what they do, do not know what they do. He forgave one of the thieves on the on the cross beside him and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. I mean, Jesus was still Jesus, even up on the cross in his personality. And the Roman guard had seen this. And typically when they had criminals up on the cross, uh, they didn't have people hanging up there with a forgiving nature. This was something extra special that they had never witnessed before. And then all of these natural occurrences happened and they said, we praise God, this surely must have been the Son of God. These Roman soldiers recognized who Jesus was while the Jews standing by simply mocked him. <laughs> he called himself the Son of God. If he was the Son of God, why doesn't he get himself down off the cross? But not the Roman soldiers. They praised God and they seen what had happened. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. Now what that means by beating their breast is they were convicted in their heart. We killed him. It's our fault. We're the ones that did this. Okay? They were... They were disappointed. They were grief-stricken. They were guilty. And they beat their breasts and went away. And it says, Many women who knew him were there, watching from a distance... And they had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joses, and Salome the mother of Zebedee's sons. Now when these people went away mourning, going back to Jerusalem, it actually, it actually fulfilled a prophecy from Zechariah 12.10. And that prophecy says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. 
they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. They will look upon the one they have pierced and they will mourn and grieve. Now these women that are with Jesus have been with Jesus for some time. Uh, going back to Luke chapter, chapter 8, there's an account uh, in the first three verses that reads, After this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, who had seven demons come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. And here's the important part. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. These women who left from Galilee and traveled with Jesus uh, were the ones who supported their ministry. How did they eat? Well, uh, this one woman, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who was a manager of Herod's household, was probably well-to-do. Herod was the king, and this guy was the manager. So he, Jesus had women who were uh, affluent and had money to help them in their ministry. And so they were there along with Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joses, and Salome, the mother of Zebedee's sons. And Zebedee's sons were James and John. James and John. Now it was the day of preparation, okay? So now the day of preparation is Friday, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. The Sabbath day is a Saturday. This day is special because it is the Sabbath during Passover week. So it's like the holy of holy days, a very special and sacred day. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. Now, this is called, and I'm going to try to pronounce this, crurifragium. It was the process where a Roman soldier would go up to a crucified uh, criminal and take an iron mallet and shatter, is this the tibia or the fibia? Both shatter the lower leg bones. The pain would be so intense that the person would die almost uh, within minutes from shock in their weakened state. They would just die. The pain would be overwhelming. And so the uh, chief priests came to Pilate again and said, look, we don't want any dead bodies hanging out there on crosses during our special Sabbath day. So would you please expedite their death? Pilate says, sure. He has their legs broken. But the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. That fulfills two prophecies. First of all, the Jews are following a law from Deuteronomy chapter 21 that says if someone is guilty of a capital offense and is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, you must not leave that body hanging on the pole overnight. So they don't want to break God's commandment on the holy of holy days. So this is why they ask Pilate to expedite the process. But the soldiers don't break Jesus's legs. And this has special significance because the Passover lamb, uh, part of the instructions that were given when they boiled the Passover lamb, when they, were leaving ex when they were leaving Egypt, the Hebrew slaves, they weren't to break any of the bones. Uh, this is what it says in Numbers chapter 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, when any of you, your descendants, are unclean because of a dead body or are away on a journey, they are still to celebrate the Lord's Passover, but they are to do it on the 14th day of the second month at twilight. They are to eat the lamb 
together with the unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they must not leave any of it until morning or break any of its bones. So Jesus not having his bones is symbolic with the Passover lamb, but there was a prophecy in Psalm 3420 that says, he protects all of his bones, not one of them will be broken. So it was prophesied that even though Jesus would be executed, none of his bones would be broken. Would the Romans know that? No. What kept them from breaking Jesus' bones? We don't know. Maybe the centurion stopped the uh, Roman soldier that was going to do that when he see, seen Jesus was already dead. Maybe Jesus had a profound effect on him. After all, he said, surely this is the Son of God. But instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony. And he's, John is talking about himself. The man who saw it is giving testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. <sighs> Connie's a nurse. She'll probably know this better than I do. <clears throat> But what Jesus probably had happen was a rare coronary rupture. Uh, in studying, as it explained to me, for there to be both, both blood and water, the spear probably went up underneath his ribs and pierced his heart. Now his, his heart had already stopped beating. So there wouldn't be like blood spurting out from Jesus. This says blood and water flowed together. In a coronary rupture, the lungs can fill up with blood, and then the pericardial sac around the heart can fill up with water. And so when they pierced his side, water and blood both came forth. So what, what John is trying to tell us is beyond a shadow of a doubt, know this, Jesus was dead. Nobody, nobody can deny the fact that Jesus was dead. John says he testifies to the truth, he knows he tells the truth, and that his testimony is accurate. And the details of the fact that blood and water both flowed from his side assure us, medically speaking, that Jesus was indeed dead. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision or action, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly he feared the Jews. Okay, so here comes this man, Joseph of Arimathea. And we are given some very specific details about him. First of all, he was prominent. He was rich. He was a member of the council, which is the Sanhedrin. He was one of the 70. But it said that he did not consent to the death of Jesus. We're told in Scripture that the vote was unanimous that Jesus died. So that tells us that Joseph of Arimathea was probably not present when the vote was taken. Joseph of Arimathea also had a tomb nearby. And he goes to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body. Said that he feared the Jews. He was a secret disciple of Jesus. Why did he fear the Jews? Well, we've talked about this before if Joseph of Arimathea comes out as a actual disciple and makes it public, his life as a Jew is over. He'll be kicked out of the Sanhedrin. He'll be kicked out of the synagogue. He'll be stripped of all of his wealth. He will basically lose out on all of his cultural and social rights as a Jew. So he's, he's a secret disciple of Jesus. 
But somehow, he goes boldly before Pilate. Mark says that he summoned courage. So there's something that has changed in Joseph of Arimathea. He's decided that Jesus is worth it. And he's going to go to Pilate and ask for his body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. Now, we don't know how he was brought down from the cross. Joseph of Arimathea probably had servants, but we do know he was assisted by another man, Nicodemus. We met Nicodemus a long time ago. He came to Jesus in the night and wanted to know who he was, wanted to know about salvation. He was the one that Jesus quoted John 3.16 to. Nicodemus was the one who said, well, how can a man enter his mother's womb a second time to be born again? This is that Nicodemus. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. That is a lot of ointment to keep the stink away. That's why the aloes and the myrrh were brought. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of clean linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in that garden, a new tomb, his own, cut out of the rock, in which no one had never been laid. You remember how Jesus came into Jerusalem? He came in on a colt that had never been ridden before. Now he's going to be put in a tomb that had never been uh, desecrated by a dead body before. Quite interesting. Before it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Then he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Joseph of Arimathea's tomb has great significance to prophetic scripture. In Isaiah 53, 9, this is what Isaiah writes. And this is about the suffering servant, the Messiah, Jesus. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. Jesus should have been thrown into a garbage heap with the other two men that were crucified. That's what they did with criminal bodies. They put him in a mass grave, threw him, threw him in the ditch and let the scavengers have at him. But not Jesus. He was assigned to a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So Jesus gets a rich man's tomb as prophesied. <clears throat> Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, the mother of Josie's, were sitting opposite the tomb and saw where he, would, he was laying. Now this is important because these same women will come back on Sunday with, with uh, spices and ointment to put on Jesus' body. They don't have time now because the Passover day is about to occur at 6 p.m. But they see where the tomb is. And it's a private tomb. It's not a public cemetery. This is a private tomb that has never been used close to Golgotha where Jesus was crucified. And the reason I share this with you is because many people say, oh, well, the women just got mixed up on which tomb they went and visited. That's why the tomb was empty. No, they knew exactly where the tomb was because it was private and they witnessed it firsthand. These women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. They actually saw Jesus put into the tomb and laid down. They went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. Friday is over. That was the end of our account of Jesus' life on Friday. Now next we have a very small segment of Saturday while Jesus is in the tomb, and this is very interesting. 
The next day, the one after preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. So this is the third time that Pilate has been visited by the Jews concerning Jesus. Now it's on the Sabbath day. This is quite significant because it says the chief priests and the Pharisees. So we've got the Sadducees and the Pharisees who don't like one another, and the, Fer or the Sadducees who don't believe in resurrection, coming along with the Pharisees to Pilate to ask him another request. On the Sabbath day, no less, which will make them unclean to be in a Gentile's residence. So they are, they are looking way past all kinds of differences. They're looking way beyond all kinds of God's laws for something they think is very important. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. Jesus' enemies get it. His disciples didn't. They didn't understand it. But his enemies get it. And they are concerned about Jesus' dead body. They don't think he's going to be resurrected. They're concerned about something else. So give order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And this deception will be worse than the first. Here is the greatest argument or uh, defense, apology, of the fact that Jesus died. There are so many people that say, Jesus didn't really die. Well, his enemies thought he did. His enemies knew he was dead because they were afraid that his own disciples were going to come and steal the dead body. So anybody that ever tells you that Jesus really didn't die, which by the way is what they teach in Islam, it's a lie. Jesus was dead. Even his enemies testified to the fact that he was dead. They said this deception, if his body is stolen, will be worse than than his death. Forget about him being a martyr. If they say he rises from the dead, they'll make him out to be God. <laughs> and we know that's what happens. Pilate said, take a guard. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. This is what they did. They took a Roman, uh, I can't think of the right word now, a centurion and likely three soldiers with them to the tomb where he, Jesus was laid. They took wax and a cord and they strung it across the stone. And then they took Pilate's signet ring and placed it in the wax that signified that that tomb was sealed by the order of Pilate. That would scare away any grave robbers because if they tried to break the seal, they could be crucified. Not to mention the fact that they post a guard there. You see, there are so many, <laughs> there are so many things that cannot be denied about Jesus' death. These little details that we talk about are so important because they solidify our faith. They help us explain what happened when people give us a chance to share the gospel. And Jesus' crucifixion is amazing. Jesus' burial is amazing. Jesus' resurrection is amazing. It's all amazing. <laughs> Next time when we get together, we're going to start to study the resurrection. But it was important that you hear these details about how he was buried and cared for by these men and these women so that you have the full story. Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity again to assemble in your house this morning. And Father, we are so very grateful for these words that were written down by your apostles that have stood the test of time. It's quite an amazing thing that a document as old as your holy scriptures not only be uh, in circulation today, but be relevant and true as it was when it was written. Father, we're, we're just so grateful that we have this so that our faith isn't that of a shallow faith, but one that is solid in evidence and testimony. Father, our, our faith is everything to us as Christians. We, we place our very lives and the hope for a resurrection in you. We believe your word. We believe your son. We believe what the apostles wrote. And so, Father, just in that, please accept this gesture of faith from us. And we pray it's pleasing to you, Father. Father, help us always remember these details, not only for our own sake, but for the sake of others, that we might say, this is what happened. This is what was written down. This can't be made an argument against. Father, we have a, a great story to tell, one like never has happened before and will never happen again. And Father, we look forward to next Sunday when we start to study the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's through that resurrection, Father, that we have hope in something eternal. And through Jesus, we know that it is eternal life not eternal death. We praise you for all of these things and more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.